Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and one of the real joys I have in hosting L'Chaim is getting to sit with some of the most interesting, creative, often brilliant men and women on the world Jewish scene, and simply engaging them in conversation, learning about them, sharing ideas and perspectives with them. And I hope that through the conversations you hear on L'Chaim, we all learn more about aspects of Jewish life, about issues challenging the state of Israel, about the issues which are at the center of our world. And on this edition of L'Chaim, I have the wonderful opportunity to sit with a remarkable individual for whom, from whom I learn all the time. And if you're a regular viewer of JBS, you know him well. It's my pleasure to be joined by Micah Halpern, author, syndicated columnist, political commentator, an expert who lectures widely on issues of terrorism, the Middle East, Muslim fundamentalism, and he's consulted for the White House and for the Justice Department. Micah's online blog is called The Micah Report, and Micah's best-selling book, Thugs, chronicles the story of the most notorious leaders in history, from deranged dictators to corrupted czars, from Herod the Great to King Farouk and Mao Zedong and Imelda Marcos. And one of the most wonderful things that's happened to me doing JBS is developing a friendship with a very special and brilliant human being who I'm proud to say now hosts his own weekly program here on JBS called Thinking Out Loud, Micah Halpern. And Micah, thank you so much for sitting with us. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for inviting me. So I want to begin by just, I don't know, letting the audience get to know you a little bit better. Um, and not only that, there are things about you I don't know. So you know, take me back to where it all began. Where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? What was your family like? I was born in Pittsburgh, but soon after, my family moved to Annapolis, Maryland. How interesting. Uh, very different, a very unique place, a colonial city with cobblestone streets and, and um, on the water, of course, and uh, the state capital, a former capital of the United States of America, actually. Washington resigned his commission in, in Annapolis. A small town, a small town Judaism in a way that really doesn't exist today. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up there. It was a major fundamental um, uh, informative element. It was a thoughtful environment. It was a place where, where um, uh, Jewish life was, was exciting and dynamic. In for Annapolis. A, for a small town. In Annapolis. Right, because we were very close to Baltimore and very close to Washington. And so the people who were members of the congregation, the Orthodox congregation that we were in, um, were involved. They were engaged in, in national and local politics, and they were engaged in, uh, in Jewish life. What brought your family to Annapolis? My father uh, had a PhD in chemistry and a PhD in physics, and he was a, uh, um, a brilliant, brilliant thinker, and a classicist also, not just a scientist. So what he was had a lab. His name was Halpern. Uh, uh, Yisrael Chaim was his Yiddish name, but his name was Ernie, Ernest. Um, and he had a lab in Annapolis and in Washington. There wasn't a lab, laboratory the way you think of laboratories with test tubes. He had, his laboratory was a, was a room much like the studio, just filled with chalkboards. So he was a theoretical thinker. So, uh, and the boards, he would write on the boards. And he would sit in the chair in the middle with all these boards all around him solving problems. A guy would stick his head in and ask a question. He would solve the problem on the boards. And he had many people that were working on his models as he was creating them. Which you remember practice. seeing this oh, as yeah, a remember, child? Yes, I remember seeing this. Going to his lab and seeing, you know, he, in this, it's right out of a television show or a movie, you know, uh, where all these things are around him. And it, that was the images that were superimposed on it. And then he would go out and watch as other people were doing his, putting together the things that he had designed on the board in terms of models. Chemical equations, all kinds of circles and squares and this and that. But that's what happened. That was who he was. I didn't see him as a scientist for a long time. I never 
thought of him as a scientist. I thought of him as a thinker, as someone who learned, learned Torah, as a fundamentalist thinker of Torah. Um, but my parents weren't, um, weren't the kind of, uh, they weren't observant the way I'm observant today. They were less observant than me. Um, what was your name, mother's name? My mother's name is, and she, she lived until she's 120, is uh, Marilyn. Okay. Um, and, uh, Did they became, have any other children? Yes, I'm the youngest of three. My uh, in strange, in interesting issues, uh, the, I'm nowhere close to or similar to my siblings in many ways. I was an athlete, a scholar-athlete as a kid. They weren't interested at all in those things. Um, Okay, and where do you go to college? I went to college, undergraduate to Maryland, and then to graduate school to Brandeis. And then from there, I taught at Brandeis and moved on to Yale, where I, where I taught. And then, I, uh, then from there to Jerusalem, where I, um, where I spent, and where I, I began. There I went as a, as a professor, as a teacher. I went to teach in the, in the university there, and then in the, in the yeshiva there also. And that's where I got my rabbinical degrees. Also you have smicha. Yeah. You've never been a practicing rabbi, no. but you have bismicha. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and, that, and that became my Israeli orientation. So I was in the world of academics and yeshiva at the same time in Israel. And there was a whole business of people that was just starting of these new programs, the, the gap year program. And so I spent a lot of time teaching them as they began to expand. And so there was plenty of space for me there. And then I, um, I engaged in Eastern European stuff. I created an institute for the study of European Jewry, which was important. Where? Um, in Jerusalem itself, which focused on European Jewry and giving educational background to people who were going and bringing groups to, to Europe, not as a Holocaust-related trips, but rather Holocaust married together with the great history in the past of Europe, as opposed to focusing on that. I got involved in the whole thing because people were coming back from trips in Europe at the very, very beginning. And their only education was based on guides from the local communities, not the Jewish communities, the local guides that really knew nothing of Jewish life. I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I, spent, I had spent a lot of time in Europe before that, and I had the academic expertise in the area. So I was able to sort of in insert these things. They became important models. Take a step back. Where do you think the initial interest in so much of Jewish history, Jewish culture, Jewish life. Where does that begin for you, and why does it begin? I mean, there were probably three uh, legs to the stool that I, uh, that I sat upon that were enormously important to my life as a, as a child. My family was very, very important in their desire. My mother's a professional Jewish volunteer, so her involvement and her creativity and her constant desire to be part of everything, whether it was the Chavah Kedisha or whether it was uh, mailings. I remember stacks of mailings. We don't have mailings today, <laughs> right? Everything's email. Stack. My mother literally was the recording secretary and the, and the corresponding secretary of two or three organizations where she was doing the mailings uh, for the organization, for the synagogue and everything connected to it, which is folding and stuffing and, and addressing and labeling and sending out and wrapping and, and weighing and all the things that synagogues used to require in order for people to know what was going on before there were websites. And I remember that. I remember every day she went to uh, the synagogue in order to drop off things, pick up things, do a part, and that's what happened. I remember her changing over the, the, uh, um, the Sidurim from holiday services to, to year these services, you know. I remember her making sure the, the flowers were in the right spot for the events, whatever they were. That was what she did. Uh, my father's res role was a major player, not just in synagogue life and in organizational life and everything else, but um, it was very, very interesting and very important in terms of their, who Talk they were. Talk more about what his so, role was and well, what did he do? One of the things, things that he did is he said one has to, one can't just simply uh, be. Many people don't become members. He said, you can't, you have to be a member. You have to get involved. And membership includes, includes payment of dues. It includes coming to activities. It includes saying what's on your mind. It includes trying to make a difference. And if you don't do that, you're not really a part. You can call yourself Jewish, but you're Jewish in name only. The people who count are the people who get involved. And so you've got to step up. We would say to people, it's not good enough for you to just come here when you want to say Kaddish. You've got to do something. You've got to get involved and not just in the Jewish world in general. I remember when, when he passed away, when he died, we went, uh, we, were in, uh, we went to Annapolis to bury him, of course, and to give Hesped 
to give eulogies and various things like before. And people were coming up to me and saying, you know, I, you know I'm the cashier in the, local, in the local store. Your father would come and he saw that I was pregnant after my fifth child and said, you know, are you thinking of savings? Or are you just thinking, you know, let's create a savings plan? You know, and she said, she said to me, I, I, I knew your father because he came and he bought stuff, but how did I? It's, he sat there and he taught me how to save. He taught me how to create a plan for my family. I didn't even know him, and he did this. My father was very unique in that way. He got involved. He did things. Um, he was understated in other ways. That was, uh, somebody, that was one major leg of the chair, or the stool, I should say. The community was the other. And uh, the community said there were communal leaders that weren't necessarily in seeing eye to eye with my parents, by the way. My father was an eccentric. There's no question. He was different. Uh, but that communal leadership was very important. He didn't, because he disagreed with him, didn't mean he removed himself from the community. <laughs> Give me one example of how I mean, he was right. different or disagreed. He, uh, he thought, let's say, rabbinic leadership often cowtailed to, uh, to, um, to the powerful uh, donors of the community. But it does. Uh, he, and he made it clear that they shouldn't. <laughs> that didn't necessarily mean that he rejected their leadership. Mm -hmm. He said, you have to support what's right, not necessarily... <laughs> the plutocracy, the plutocracy is this great uh, Greek concept which suggests that the people who control things are the, are the rich <laughs> and famous of the world. He said one has to do what's right, not necessarily what, what the people who are paying mm -hmm. the bills. You have to stand up to them also. Your father was a real idealist, wasn't he? Yes, it? yes. And a practical person also, though. He, he believed in what was right. And uh, the same thing with regard to Israel. You can't, uh, because Israel is... Uh, um, Israel needs to do the right thing regardless whether or not the message is always the best uh, optics as, uh, as the term we use in today's terminology. You have to do what's right. And that's not always popular. And uh, he was very excited by the leadership of, uh, of Menachem Begin, let's say, for instance, who said, you know, we have to do what's right. Um, that was important. And the third stool was actually a Jewish movement that I was a part of, a Zionist movement. I was a major player and, and participant and uh, in young Judea. And that made me who I was. Um, it gave me leadership control and power. It taught me how to teach myself. It taught me that in order to teach, I had to prepare. I had to learn. I had to read and well before the internet <laughs> existed. I had to learn from others. I had to seek out people in order to understand things. And then I had the responsibility to convey that knowledge and that to others, uh, both in camp settings as well as in the movement settings during the, during the year. Young Judea was an enormously important element in my life. Uh, and I balanced that against my school, music, and sports. You mentioned music twice. What do you mean by music? Well, I was a part of a band, a major band. What, what instrument did I you play? I played trumpet. I played trumpet. You played trumpet. Do you still um, play trumpet? I have. Uh, um, Could you still play trumpet? Well, the uh, amateur uh, weekends <laughs> over time. I can certainly play chauffeur. Um, and I can play musical. I can actually play musical renditions on the chauffeur. <laughs> on various chauffeurs, of multiple octaves, all kinds of things, which is, yes. Um, that said, you have a month from Elul to Tishrei, you have a month before Rosh Hashanah to practice, and most of that time is spent in practicing, um, not necessarily because I blow for any, any group, but just because I practice during that time. And I blow for the family, I blow for people who need, uh, etc. But yeah, um, but to play seriously now would take a, uh, you know, a few weeks of okay. building the but you But you were pretty good at one point. Yes, yes, I was very good at it. And I loved it. And it was a major part of my social life. And it, it brought me against, it, it corresponded to these other two elements, which were young Judea and sports. The sports people, the only two or three were actually interested in academics and, and right. culture. They were more interested in, 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 um, uh, in sex and drugs and <laughs> those kind of parties and stuff like that, which really wasn't my interest at the time. And so it brought those things. So there was the balance that took place in my life. But Young Judea was very important to me. And then I became a Young Judean leader in, in school, in university, and then in graduate school, and even but afterwards. We should make, make sure people know Young Judea continues to be a powerful influence even today. Yeah, I would say that the two major powers that opened doors in my life professionally were Yale and Young Judea, mm -hmm. if you can imagine that. That's how you know, it's a, the, the, the world... It's fascinating to hear you compare Young Judea and the doors it opens... To Yale. To Yale. Yes. That's talk, hard to... Talk about another moment imagine. about how is that possible? Well, I mean, uh, you, well, it's weird, but it had an impact on a lot of people. 
and and then and the parents who had kids in it also were a part of the okay. young to the young to the parents. Again, I, I, don't, I don't want to cheat our audience. Hold on, I don't want to cheat our audience. There are going to be people who know Young Judea who are watching, but many people really don't understand what Young Judea is. Take a moment and describe. I have wonderful friends who, whose lives were changed dramatically, who became rabbis because right. of Young Judea, Absolutely. who made Aliyah because of Young Judea, who became passionate Zionists, regardless of what their profession is. And I'm or, one of those friends of yours. Okay, you probably didn't know right. it was Young Judea. No, I did not know. And, and, and now when you but put me... But explain what Young Judea I is. I will. And when you put me now in the prism of you see all those other characters, I probably line up right with them Yes. in terms of my orientation, my openness to different ideas, uh, my openness to other forms of Judaism, my love of Israel, uh, my love of community, and my responsibility. To and you and trace that, that back that to Young Judea. That is absolutely a part of Young Judea. And every one of those people, and I will go through the list of them, whether it be through the reform movement that you've seen. Uh, my mentor, one of my great mentors, uh, David Brutherman, was a major part of that and world. He was a, and, he was a colleague of mine in rabbinical, rabbinical school. school. So, and, and he was a teacher of mine. Do you and, know and Norman Cohen? Judea, and Norman Cohen was exactly that generation. And yes, of course. And those are they. And when you see it, yes. academically, intellectually, but also in terms of their dynamism. Yes. Their and they were influenced by the generation before them. Before them in Young Judea. Yeah, right. Exactly. And their mentor is my mentor. And we teach exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. We teach it. In other words, you can actually point to, point to the point. Joke, uh, point, 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 joke, point, 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 joke. You have the whole element. <laughs> yes. Digressions are so important. And, and that, uh, that's just one okay. element. So Encapsulate young Judea, the philosophy of Young Judea. Young Judea is a Zionist youth movement that really believed in pure leadership. It was originally sponsored by Hadassah. And just over the last few years, Hadassah has withdrawn itself from that and with, uh, with regard to uh, camps also. It's a very interesting uh, component. Hadassah's relationship with Young Judea, I don't want to get into in, in, in that detail. But at the time, Hadassah was very much a part of it. And Hadassah was the most powerful women's movement in America, certainly, and Zionist movement, absolutely. They were a powerhouse. And, and what it did is they, they empowered kids to be youth leaders, to talk about their issues of import, which was Zionism and the role of Judaism and Israel in their lives. And it was transformative to me. And it gave me something which was different than everyone else in my junior high school and high school. For them, the important things were going to school, having sports, into music, whatever it was. I had this other thing which bound me to Jews across the world and put me in a car and drove me to North Carolina and to Ohio and this and that, all in order to be a part of a, of a convention or an idea. Uh, which debated um, dual loyalty issues of whether or not you're a Jew first or, a, uh, or an American first, all these various things that when you're a kid, they were important. Of course, it was exciting. And it observed Judaism in a way which I thought was worthwhile. Meaning? Meaning that it wasn't that halacha was a part of it and Jewish life was a part of it and Shabbat was a part of it and Shabbat meals were a part of it and, and davening was a part of it and everything else in a, in a very egalitarian way, which both respected people who were more traditional like myself and people were not traditional at the same time. So it gave me an openness to say, uh, hey, I am not rigid in my interpretation of Judaism. And I don't want to be that way. And I don't want my, uh, my generation of students to be that way. I don't want me, my family to be that way either. Do you realize how lucky you were to have that as a gift of orientation to you? Because you and I have talked about this in other contexts. We live in a time, Michael, when Every, everybody is just rigid in an ideology, and it's almost as if you're not part of that ideology, there's something wrong with you, as opposed to this broad approach. And, you know, you, you know one of the things we've tried to do here at JBS is say, all things Jewish. And I, I was very lucky, the audience has heard this before, but I was very lucky in that all four of my grandparents came from a different, I just didn't say it that way, I have every stream of Judaism <laughs> in my background. My grandfather on my mother's side was an Orthodox rabbi with Smicha from the Slobodki Yeshiva in Lithuania. My other grandfather was a colleague of Mordechai Kaplan, helped him found mm -hmm. the Reconstructionist Movement. I grew up in a conservative household, mainstream Talmud Torah, conservative, and I'm, you know, I'm the Baal Kore on Shabbat, and my father's the lay leader. And when I decide to become a rabbi, I go to the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, because I philosophically was more comfortable there than I would have been anywhere else. And lo and behold, that gave me a perspective which you are now, so you are echoing. And the perspective yeah. is, there is no one way to be a Jew. 
and that every stream of Judaism has strengths and weaknesses, but we're all part of the same Amcha. We're all part of the same people. And you were given that gift of understanding. Uh, it, 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 in some way, it wasn't that you were looking for it, but there it was given to you. And it's interesting to hear you say how much that has shaped who you are as a Jew. I am a Jew. I am the Jew I am because of that experience and because of the rabbinic leaders that were around me also. And because I grew up in a small town. I, um, I probably would not have been that way had I been um, a product of a, of a community where there were us and them, <laughs> which was very different. In the community that I was in, there was us. And then there were those who hated us. And not that I was, or that anti-Semitism was a major part of my life, but it was a part of my, my older siblings. Um, they really felt it. Now, one of the reasons probably is that I was an athlete, so I, I found a popularity in another way. Um, but remember, I have a very, very uniquely Jewish name, um, which is important as to, my, as to my brother and sister. And a very Their biblical names? name, Ita and Ethan. And... Um, but it meant that there was a, uh, an identifiability of who we were immediately. Everyone knew us for who we are. And um, I didn't shun it. But being in the more popular groups maybe stymied some of the anti-Semitism that they would have felt uh, as the more uh, bookish kind of characters that they were. Or it was just a simple change in era that the three or four years or five years difference mm -hmm. in our age may have changed something also. But I remember, I remember growing up in a town where the beach club said, um, the sign said, um, I'm paraphrasing because we don't use these words anymore, um, uh, no uh, blacks, no Jews, no dogs. Uh, you know, that's what it said. That the, the yacht club did not allow Jews to be members. That's the environment that we grew up in. That was a small town. So you knew you were Jewish, for sure. Mm -hmm. If for no other reason, as Herzl said, our enemies have made us mm -hmm. one. By the way, many of the people I knew who went through Young Judea, also, very often, they met people whom they became lifelong friends with and sometimes married. Yeah. There were people who found their spouse oh, sure. through Young Judea. Sure. And uh, my, uh, some of my best friends in the world are still Young Judeans. Mm -hmm. And you'll walk into a room or into a Jewish gathering or into anywhere, certainly in Israel, it happens all the time, certainly in an, an, an American that meets an American. Um, you say, oh yeah, uh, you were in Young Judea, what year were you on your course? When yes. you were in camp? Or, or you were my, just uh, on Passover, I was in Passover the other day in a hotel where I was the scholar in residence. And um, in Orlando, Florida, a professor was on sabbatical to Harvard there from Jerusalem. He comes to, to me after my first lecture and he says, um, hi. I said, oh my goodness, I haven't seen you in 20 years. He was my chanich, my student in camp and then in young, uh, on your course. Um, and you see them all over. I'll be talking in a, uh, in a museum to my wife, and someone will come up and say, I recognize your voice from, from 25 years ago or from 15 years ago. Uh, this is what happens. The, the groups, ha it, it, all the time. And um, it opens doors, it helps you. Uh, you talk about Young Judea, you deal with Young Judea. It's a major part of who we were. One more question to help those who do not know what Young Judea is. Is it a fanatic pro-Zionist group? Well, I don't know about fanaticism. I'm sure there were fanatics in it. Um, it. It pushed Aliyah to anywhere, but not necessarily to kibbutz, or not necessarily to here, or not necessarily to there. Um, there were t uh, tensions. You know, what do you do with the people who, who outwardly say, you know, they're not interested in Aliyah? They were welcome also, uh, because it was a group and an organization which, which idolized uh, um, and idealized and idolized, idolized the... Uh, Olim and idolized the concept of going to Israel to be a part of it. Um, that was a part of who we were. And of course, I made Aliyah from there. Um, I didn't broadcast it, by the way. I didn't announce it, which it happened in, in Young Judea very often, where you announced your, uh, your intentions. Uh, intentions to make Aliyah. Um, it was a, a fanatic, no. It was everything but. It was not. It, it was oh, everything Young but. Judea is not. It was everything fanatic. but. Right. And um, it was unabashedly pro Israel. Yes. Uh, unabashedly Zionist. It was, um, it tended to le lean towards the left. Uh, on the right, they had to be more aggressive uh, to get their statements uh, heard, because, but that was the Jewish community of the time. Um, I don't know where it is right now. I have no idea where it is right now. It claimed that it was a non-partisan uh, uh, group. 
uh, both religiously as well as Correct. science, which right. meant that you had, you had this ability to make your way around. And it was very, very interesting. It was uh, more powerful and more interesting intellectually because of that, because it was not, you didn't get shoehorned or pigeonholed in that world. And you could express yourself. But for me, it was, it was very important because it gave me the ability to uh, argue, reason, learn, teach, uh, all within the context of the Jewish life. And it, wasn't, it, didn't, it, didn't, uh, it didn't put people down who weren't in that category. So it embraced those ideas. Is it fair for me to say that you love both the Jewish people and Judaism, and really the state of Israel. Is it fair for me to use the word love? Yeah, sure. I mean, it is, it is uh, part of my raison d'etre, um, is the Jewish people in Israel. That without it, even if, I, even if I wasn't in the Jewish world, and I balance myself and straddle many worlds, my, the essence of who I am, uh, first and foremost, uh, is Jewish, and a lover of Israel. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I can't separate that in my ideas. I can't. And I won't. Okay. And I won't separate I it understand. Out. The reason I ask it to you that, that way is I am aware, you know, you say you straddle many worlds. Mm -hmm. I have been struck, and this is from basically the first time I met you, I've been struck by the range of different concerns that you have become expert in. And so you, know, you lecture all over the place on terrorism, yes. Muslim fundamentalism, Absolutely. as well as almost any issue having to do with the state of Israel and Judaism. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me how that happens? Very often people develop a passion for a specific area of expertise. But you have so many. As you look back, how do you think it happens that it's not simply the Jewish world that you become expert in, but there are many disciplines that you are really competent in and people come to you and you have the right to both lecture and write about these things. Mm -hmm. How did that happen, Micah? You know, it's an interesting challenge that is, um, uh, first, natural curiosity is a part of it. Secondly, is uh, what, I'm an autodidact. That means I can teach myself. One of the things that schools actually are supposed to teach you is not to memorize, but how to learn, and then how to learn on your own. How to actually do it on your own is a very difficult thing. And that's what, that, forget about graduate school. I'm <laughs> actually talking about undergraduate school and high school if that were possible. That's one thing. I had great models in front of me. They also, it's much like the, Mark Twain describes this river called the Plath River, which is a mile wide and an inch deep. I hope I'm not that, but I hope at least I'm a mile wide. Um, having a, a, a curiosity, natural curiosity, to then to discover something and then become a master of it because it interests you is something that uh, all serious academics should have but don't. Most academics focus more and more internally and more, and more narrowly than they should. And that gives them pleasure. For me, that doesn't give me pleasure. Pleasure for me is a much broader base and trying to draw connections between the different things. And so the more I know about different items, ideals, concepts, languages, cultures, the more I can draw the connections between those societies. I'm often called by uh, people a, 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 tra a cultural translator. That Of all the languages I know, and I know many, it's not because I know them perfectly. It's rather that I understand the cultures within them and can then translate from them. And that's one of the things. But also, even kosher wine. I love kosher wine. I write on kosher wine. I speak on kosher wine all over the world. How did one become an expert on kosher wine when there wasn't? Because I was curious. One becomes curious and one learns. And then one writes and then one creates a resume based on the, the writing. And actually, once one says things and writes things and discusses things which are, are palpable and tangible and, and you get on the, on the map and then you become quoted by other people and other people want to hear you based on that. Uh, and that's how one becomes, that's how I became an expert in so many different things. And it's also simply because I said, a lot of people have not, some of these topics are not digestible for people, which is another major problem. Many of the things that we deal with in the Jewish world, but also the non-Jewish world, for some mysterious reason, they've become the purview and discussed only by experts. Well, one of the things I've tried to do is become a communicator, both in the written form and in the 
oral form. And now in the television, the television form also. How do you translate that so that people can understand complicated concepts in very distilled and condensed ways? It's really hard. That's another Mark Twain line. Mark Twain says, I'm sorry I wrote such a long letter. I didn't have enough time to write a short one. So when you distill big concepts, it requires time. And that time then can be mm -hmm. conveyed in short ideas only after you've really mastered the material. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the things you also do is you bring a critical faculty to the way in which the media in general communicates information to people. In general, to what extent do you feel when people pick up a newspaper, whether it's the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, or they turn on network television, or they turn on CNN, or Fox, or MSNBC. To what extent do you feel the media at the moment conveys the news and information accurately, fairly, adequately? To what extent are you disappointed in the way in which we, the public, are given information through the media? I think the whole approach to media is, has to be uh, viewed differently. Um, the Jewish world and um, the, the critical world of the media itself, it's just not about getting the facts right or wrong. One has to realize, one must realize, that the news today is an entertainment business. Mm -hmm. And once that sort of becomes the backdrop or the prism through which one views the news, one can then understand it a little better. It's about entertainment. So just like, by the way, the weather is about entertainment also. There could be the possibility of a snowflake 200 miles to the northwest of us, and it will lead <laughs> in the stories because there's a possibility of snow. And then people start to, oh, man, it's going to snow tomorrow. Well, it's not. <laughs> not anywhere close to where you are. Just way over there, maybe it's a possibility. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't make mistakes, and sometimes when they say it's not going to snow, it does snow. I'm not talking about that. It becomes entertainment, and part of it is the, the, the pull of that exaggeration. So extremists tend to get headlines in stories, especially about Israel, and rational thinkers don't, and mainstream thinkers don't either, and that's sad, but that doesn't portray what's really happening in the storylines. One has to see that in the stories themselves and in the, in the nature of the beast. There's another element within this, the coverage of the Middle East and certainly coverage of Israel, is that the reality is that uh, Israel was the favorite child and the fair-haired child of the, the media for a very long time. Uh, but then David, as the story goes, becomes Goliath. And when that happens, you don't, Israel should not be and cannot become Liechtenstein, right, or Lux, Luxembourg, right? <laughs> These tiny little fiefdoms in the middle of, uh, of Europe where no one even knows where they are and the less cares or happens to read about them. Israel is interesting because people are interested in it. And that sometimes means that the things that they're going to be focusing on, the media is going to be focusing on not the, the nicest elements the positively Israel elements, the things that make Israel look good. One has to realize that. That doesn't make it any less a spectacular environment. Um, I am critical very often the way in which the press uh, focuses on Israel, mostly because I think the press is lazy, and the stories they get are not necessarily deep or insightful. They're just lazy, and what comes to them they run with. Um, that said, it's what happens. Uh, do I think that Israel gets a fair shake? I think Israel is in the news, and I'm happy it's in the news, <laughs> really happy. Uh, do I think that the press adequately and appropriately shows the different angles and the nuance? I don't even think they're interested. Uh, people like me have a purpose in the news because we give what's called perspective. Perspective requires a lot more space, and we're only entitled perspective after the news is run, so to speak. And that's sad, mm -hmm. but the reality is network news only has a few minutes, and even cable news doesn't have much more. That's just the reality. Um, 
And you said it's entertainment. It's all about entertainment. Mm -hmm. and Where do you get your information? Where do you get your news? Well, I'm blessed with the skill of languages, not just the Hebrew, but the other languages also. And it's important to monitor these things. It's really important to figure out what's not being said and then make the phone calls or send the emails to figure out why this was left out. And if something is missing here, <laughs> let's find what the story is. So I monitor a lot of press. I watch it happening. There are uh, services that monitor that press for you also, which is important. In today's day and age of, of Google and other things, you can actually have everything connected with a word sent to your inbox so that you can actually find those things, which is good. It requires a lot of time and energy, but now at this point in my life, I'm, I'm, I'm very good at it and very fast at it, so I can, I can get rid of a lot of stuff. And things are a repetition I don't need to deal with um, in terms of the news. But it's important to find the original sources. It's important to get to, uh, to read languages in Hebrew, to read the okay. Hebrew press and the Arabic press. Do it's you try to get, to get your press. information from the New York Times? I read the New York Times every day at least three times on air, online, and, and on the... I don't read the hard copy the way I once did. I once read the hard copy very differently, but I'm reading it online. Um, the New York Times is two days, three days a week behind what I'm covering and what I'm reading about in the Arabic world and in the Hebrew world. A week behind at least. And that's if they decide to run with the story themselves. Uh, I, you have to read... I did a piece on this for, for my thinking out loud. The New York Times has to be read. I respect the viewers that, that boycott the Times. I respect that, and I understand why they do it. I can't not read the Times. It's the most powerful English language uh, uh, media journal organ in the world, and it needs to be responded to. Part of this unit, part of what you do here, part of the show you gave me is to respond to them, in a, in, by the way, in a, in a respectful way. My critique of everything is a respectful way because I believe that is necessary. But it can't happen in a vacuum. So the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or whoever is irresponsible needs to be held accountable to it, not uh, to those ideas. So yes, I read the Times. Do I get my news from them? There are, things when I, uh, there are times when I learn from the Times I didn't uh, learn before, but not, not often, not often, certainly on the issues in the Middle East and stuff. I respect tremendously their columnists even when I disagree with them. I think Friedman is an unbelievable writer and a gifted, gifted personality. I think that uh, he has done spectacularly for foreign policy of the United States as a result of it. Um, do I think that he's right all the time? No. But that's okay. Uh, I respect that. And I'm saying, look, there's a piece I did on a tape that we did for a show which is going to air uh, soon of the New York Times who took to task um, football hooligans, soccer anti-Semitism in Europe on a Sunday paper in the New York Times. And it was an editorial, not an op-ed. They said, enough of this. I got to appl applaud them. And that's how I ended the piece. I said, kudos to the New York Times. They're not even covering it in Europe anymore. Anti-Semitism common is commonplace. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. New York Times is covering that. Out of curiosity, do you also read the Wall Street Journal? Of course. Of, of course. course. Of course. How can I not? If I'm reading the Times, I have to read the Journal. I read the New York Post also. I read almost everything that comes out. But those, the Wall Street Journal I have to read because it's one of the only papers that's making money in America. And I have to understand why that is. It is a paper that sees itself as a counterbalance to the New York Times and really does. And it does a very good job of it. It's not as good at elements of culture and literature, which the Times is unparalleled in. Um, but it's trying to work its way out in that way also. I know you have an interest in culture and, mm -hmm. and those things also. The Times is still unparalleled. Okay. In, in, you uh, mentioned in Thomas Friedman from the Times. What do you think of Brett Stevens from the Wall Street Journal? I like Brett. I think that he's uh, articulate. He doesn't have the style and the grace that, uh, that Tom Friedman has. Um, I think that uh, Brett is analytical. I think that he, uh, like Friedman, uh, uh, paints a, a particular point of view and holds to it. And I think that that, in both of their ways, I think that is their downfall. I don't think that they're honest to other ideas because of it. They really are, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call them partisan in that way, whether it be left of center or right of center on various issues. Um, and I, I took, I loved, I loved Thomas Friedman's interview with uh, President Obama in the White House. I was deeply critical of it, though, 
Because? Because I did not think that um, Obama, though Friedman asked the questions, I do not think that the, um, the reality uh, came to play and came to the fore. Uh, Friedman asked them the questions and asked them again, but you can only ask so many times, so to speak. Um, I think he should have and could have been much more critical of the president in other ways um, and forced more uh, clarity on questions. But look, the Times had that, and the next week had a piece by John Bolton on bombing Iran, which you should have found in the Wall Street Journal. But even the New York Times is saying, and this is important for the people who boycott the New York Times, again, you got me defending the Times, which is not what I want to do. The Times put that piece in the paper to say, it's, we are seriously questioning the perspective of the White House right now. And they gave it a platform where Bolton is the character that almost everyone is saying, if a Republican wins the White House, Bolton should be Secretary of State. Uh, that's a huge, huge mm -hmm. item. Mm -hmm. As you look at Jewish life today, what worries you or concerns you most? I mean, that's a whole other hour of discussion, at least, if not three or four or five. And I actually have solutions to the problems also. But identify the problem first. The biggest problem that the Jewish world confronts is freedom of choice. And on the other hand, that's what makes Jews so creative and free in today's I world. I have to say, I am shocked. Uh, I never would have, I've never heard that from somebody. It's not a, something I would have anticipated. The problem in the Jewish world is freedom, freedom of, of choice. choice. What do you mean? Our, parent, our parents and grandparents' generation didn't have a freedom of choice. They were Jewish because they had to be. Um, there was no option out. They could not choose to be something else. I'm not talking about assimilation. You see, assimilation is a whole different world. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about simple options in front of you. The options in front of a 13-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 18-year-old, 21-year-old, 25-year-old, and even a 30-year-old, an unmarried 13-year-old, 30-year-old, the options are freedom, which even I as a child didn't have in terms of my Jewish life. Even though others did have that choice probably, I did not have that choice because the, the values, the images, the role models around me did not give me the choice to sort of say, you know, do whatever you want. We were involved in the Jewish world whether it be through Young Judea, the Jewish synagogue, or the temple, or, or, uh, or family life. That was what we had. Today, they don't have that. You have the freedom to choose anything and to be as creative as you want within that world. Didn't happen before. Didn't happen. And so that freedom is the biggest challenge. Now, how do you solve that? It's a whole different world. No, why do you have to solve it? Why does, wh implicit in what you're saying is it is a problem. And I want you to identify more specifically how you see it as a problem. What's the danger as a result of it? The danger is that our, our community is based on volunteerism. As opposed to? Obligation. Um, even in the Orthodox world, even in the Orthodox world, it's based on volunteerism. So an Orthodox Jew, a graduate of a Jewish day school, will go off to a university, a massive university, an Ivy League university, and will choose to engage whenever they want. He or she will desire uh, this program and will come to that event, this Friday night service, this Friday night meal. Maybe even not wake up for Shabbat morning services, but will go to Friday night. Maybe not wake up, period, on Shabbat morning. Okay, we'll do whatever they want to do. And that's their choice. And they have the ability to decide that on their own. That was not what we had. Um, Sure, other people had a choice. But for us, the community depends on me being there. Just like the community depends on me being there in the morning and in the evening as a part of a minion. Not because I'm saying cottage, because other people are. Because without me, it wouldn't happen. It's not something that I say, I think about. It's a requirement of who I am. It's what happens. Now, that's not the case today. A community based totally on volunteerism is almost impossible to sustain. Mm -hmm. Certainly, buildings that require them. How can you have a synagogue which is used four hours a week? A building used four hours a week, that's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. It's a model that can't work. It can't function. Synagogues can't function on four hours. And if even 
a synagogue, if you add up the hours of time where you actually are functioning in the synagogue itself, your best synagogue performance comes to the equivalent of a day of operation, of nine or ten hours of operation. It doesn't happen. You don't have activities. This is a model which can't sustain itself because of volunteerism. That was not the case in other places. So Jewish community centers is a different story. Synagogues aren't functioning that way. Okay. I want to... I want to make sure people again understand what you're saying by the word volunteerism. When you said that when you were young and to this day, you make sure you're at the minion because someone else has to say Kaddish, and there's something that drives you internally sure. to be at that, at that minion service. And that's just you know, one little piece. That's an example. It's an example. Like it. Tzedakah is the same example. Yes, exactly. all of Jewish life. Right. There at one point was a, and I'm going to use a generic word, there was an ideology. It wasn't a theology. It was an ideology that ultimately the Jew had a, lived under a sense of mitzvah, a sense of commandment. And one of the commandments that you personally felt touched you, you were obligated was to be there for a minion so that the Torah could be read and the Kaddish could be said and, and all the things that minions are, are necessary sure. for. But it really represents a larger sense of where you saw yourself in the Jewish world. When you say volunteerism, you're saying that the sense of mitzvah that drove so much of who you were and are to this day, that sense of mitzvah does no longer exist and that the young person you're talking about who's in college and who knows that there's a Hillel minion and says to themselves, I don't, you know, I'm perfectly happy to sleep Saturday morning and I don't need to be at the minion. I don't have to be at the Shabbat dinner. I don't have to be at the Shabbat service. I don't have to late fill in. Even the day school graduate. Exactly. Even the day school graduate. Exactly. And it's a very important point. And you made it. The issue extends into the Orthodox sure. world as well. And that's not to say that there are not many Jews who still feel your sense of mitzvah, mm -hmm. but there is a growing, growing, growing number who don't. And that, when you do not have the sense of mitzvah and obligation, you're, you're contrasting that by using the word Volunteer. voluntarism. But what you're really saying is... Versus obligation. Yes. What so you're really saying is obligation. the Jew, the young, more and more young and older Jews, this is not probably that even in our generation there were, there were many of people course. who had no sense of mitzvah. But you're worrying that it is becoming more pervasive. And therefore, coming back to your original point, when you're talking about Jews have choice, freedom of choice, what you mean is they don't feel this sense of obligation of mitzvah, and therefore they don't tend to show up. Exactly. They're not builders. They're not builders. We need builders as a community. We need to build and be a part of the community. Uh, in Sparta, the expression was every man a brick, right? Every man a brick. The idea was that we're the wall itself. We are the people who protect the society. It's not just someone else that does it. So we are, have come to a society where the leadership itself and, um, is obviously voluntary, but the membership itself, people are running away. They're not necessarily coming to us. They're going to other places. And that lack of obligation, or you call it mitzvah, it's not necessarily only about minion. It's about community of in course, general. Of course, of course. Just the example exactly we gave us, right. I don't want people to misunderstand this. It's not just about synagogue life. It's about communal engagement. Exactly. Engagement, which is why, let's say, for instance, song and ritual on a Friday night in, at university can be so successful, which is why you think of the silliest things, why Moishe's houses are becoming so successful. Because they have well, a group how of How successful are they becoming? Because Please. If, if they have seven examples, it's a good question, seven programs. And I'm not month, against them. I'm just saying, let's it's not become exaggerate. A panacea, right? It's, it's become let's not panacea. exaggerate It's become this. a panacea, exactly. It's weird. I would say that we're claiming success for seven programs a month yes. out of a, yeah. where 30 people come. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the level we've gotten to. Oh, but isn't that scary? That's what I'm telling you. That's why we're having the conversation. That's why I'm saying the freedom has given, uh, given voice to the fact that, that success is a group of young people getting together in a house 
uh, which says, you know, let's have a meal and a, uh, music together. And you say, well, wow, that's called success now. That was yeah. your life in Young Judea. Right. That's what we did. That was your life. Exactly. It wasn't seven times here and there with 30 exactly. people. Exactly. And that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the scary part about the freedom aspect. When you have the, the idea that you can choose to opt out, choosing to opt out means that the Jewish communal life is not uh, part of your responsibility. If it's not your responsibility, then to whom does it fall? On whom does it fall? And that becomes an interesting thing. So the Israelis say, come to us, and we'll give you the answer. Okay, come this will be the solution. Just living here and breathing our air is, um, is enough. Do you buy it's it? A, and, well, it's, a, it's an interesting Gemara that talks about this um, Avira, the Eretz, the Eretz Israel. And so um, the, 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 the uh, atmosphere, the air of the, of the land of Israel is already powerful. Yes, it does it. I mean, the language is that way. The calendar is that way. But, you know, a lot of people fall through the cracks there, too. I can say to you that um, there are great great things that are happening in the Jewish world by volunteerism, by the way. Great communal, communal creativity across the board. Great educational experiences across the board. Jewish camping life, which is unbelievable in certain, uh, certain experiences. The Israel programs, gap year as well as the yes, summer programs. Yes, you and but I are not against the exactly. concept of volunteerism. No, of course not. I mean, there's something, but by the way, majestic about it. The problem is that as majestic as it, as it is, it also means you're going to lose people. We lose a lot of people. Right. We lose a lot of Do people. you have a solution to this? Yeah, I have a lot of solutions to it. I think that uh, the first thing is that we should not water down what we are as a Jewish people. We should broadcast it and announce it in the greatest of ways. We should make certain that people, when they do come, we embrace them wholeheartedly, regardless of who they are. Because people say to me, what are you talking about? What, about? what if they're not Jewish? We've had this conversation. What if they're not Jewish? It doesn't matter to me. You say, I'm a halachic Jew. If you want to be halachic, you come to the halachic side. If you don't want to be, go to the non-halachic side. It doesn't bother me in the least. So people say to me, well, what are you talking about there? The streams are saying you have to be this way to come into the streams. It doesn't matter to me if what stream you are. Or don't be a part of the stream. Just be a part of the community. And if that means the Jewish community center, if that means the other things, then do that too. Join in whatever way, but join. It's like you asked me about my father's concept of joining. You've got to be a member. You can't expect it to happen if you're not a member. So it used to be that people joined, you know, according to your, um, your life cycle events. So you joined at birth, you joined at bar mitzvah, you joined at wedding, and you joined at death. That's what happened. That's when you joined the community. But then the community was just a synagogue. Sorry. Synagogue does not, it's not going to work. Synagogue is not a model for the Jewish world anymore. Prayer halls could function for the prayer issues. Synagogue's not functioning at all in a positive way. And rabbinic life... It's failing. I'm not talking about rabbinic knowledge. I'm not talking about learning. I'm talking about leadership. It's failed miserably. Because? Because it hasn't been able, because ultimately it, it buys into the edifice and power issues and not into the communal issues. It buys into the elements of, of building uh, buildings and keeping buildings uh, afloat as opposed to creating community, which is non-building connected. Um, it, builds on personalities as opposed to uh, group, uh, which is important. So even your successful communal life is very often built around a successful leader. <laughs> and one of the biggest challenges is how you transition from leader to leader. This is a problem. It's a real big problem. We have to build these other elements, uh, build uh, communities that, that embrace not just common values, but ideas. Um, ideas of, of giving, of nurturing, of learning, of culture, of life, of halacha also, because halacha has a major element in it, but not all at one, in one, in one swallow. It's important to get it. Uh, I think there's a great future for the Jewish world. I think our children have great opportunities in front of them on Jewish sides. I think that there are unbelievable uh, uh, resources out there, both people as well as things. I think the internet is a great gift for the Jewish life, as well as a destructive element for the community. We have to try to figure out how to balance it back and forth. I think that unfortunately we are in a, uh, in a uh, place where we, uh, Simon Ravidovich in a spectacular essay wrote, uh, the essay was called Israel, the Ever-Dying People. And he said that every generation sees itself as the last. Mm -hmm. 
And we remember, I, I remember my grandparents talking about the snow and walking uphill to go to school and everything else. Every generation sees itself as that. The reality is that we live in the world where to be Jewish, you have to actually do something. We have to embrace the people that want to do something. Um, there's a lot of money out there for sponsorships. Part of it should be a part of our, uh, our education. Look, your media is a part of that education, which is a very important element of it. But we've got to move people beyond their living rooms and their computer screens to say it's important for me to connect somehow with someone else who's just like me. Uh, that's hard to do. You're doing a fabulous job in that regard. I hope you, so. No, you really motivate us and you move us. And what you do here on JBS is fabulous, but your writing is wonderful, your speaking is wonderful. It's an honor to be associated with you, have you as a colleague and as a friend. Thank you. You keep going from strength to strength. Thank Amen. you. I mean, I mean, so. Thank you, Mark. Micah Halpern, author, syndicated columnist, political commentator. You can read his online blog, The Micah Report, and of course, watch him every week here on JBS in his program, Thinking Out Loud. It normally airs on Wednesdays at 6.30 and then a repeat. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to anything Mike has said here on L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. Presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.